She'd like to hear the ocean song again. Snap mountain trails that touch the wind. Cast her heart down long, winding country roads. From this window frame, our sunset views, tapestries of places new, and the colors. Are... But uh, we got our ocean tug uh, Hercules, uh, built in 1907. Um, so that's a tugboat, sure, but it was meant for ocean voyages. So. Uh, unlike a smaller harbor tug, it was meant to cross deep water. A lot of interesting stories there. Uh, our ferry boat Eureka is actually our second oldest ship. Um, our oldest is Balclutha, but this is our second oldest, built in 1890. And it is a San Francisco Bay ferry boat, but as far as we know, it's also the largest floating wooden structure in the world today. There are some ships that are made of wood that are bigger, uh, but they're no longer in the water like this one is. Um, and the surprising thing is, is that uh, it's a steamship made of wood, while the Baclutha is a sailing ship made of steel. So it's got some interesting comparisons. Uh, the engine on board the ferry boat uh, is five stories tall. It actually sticks out to the top of the ship. Um, but we've also got our antique car collection on board. So there's a lot of different things that we can take a look at on board uh, the Eureka as well. So uh, kind of up to you guys. Uh, if you wanted to take a look at the ferry boat or the ocean tug, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have any preference. Okay, David, uh, William, what do you want to see? Zoe? Uh, I'm waiting for somebody else I got to pick uh, last time. <laughs> Let's do the one at the back. At the back? The yeah. tugboat. The okay. tug? Oh, we'll walk down there. Yeah, let's do that one. Let's well, see. as we're walking up, I'll give you some, uh, some backstory here. Um, I've already mentioned Hercules as an ocean-going tug. And a lot of people are kind of surprised when we say ocean-going, they're tugboats, and they normally think of the movie Titanic or documentaries, ocean liners, and they see tugboats pushing these big ocean liners around the docks. Um, and so they're kind of surprised when we describe Hercules as an ocean tug. But, uh, you know, one of the things that Hercules was built to do was to tow ships like this one right over here, the Balclutha, which is a sailing ship. Um, in terms of steam technology and ships, probably the easiest thing to frame in your mind is not to consider steam as a revolutionary technology. It was kind of more of an evolutionary technology. It took steam quite a long time to put sailing ships out of business. And so there was this time period where both existed. And so for a ship like Bob Clues to come to San Francisco, they often would have been on the lookout for a tugboat like Hercules. And struck a bargain, hooked up a tow line, and towed the ship in, and later towed the ship out to sea as well. It was just safer, quicker, and easier, um, and cheaper uh, to do your arrangements that way. So that was one typical use that you might see of Hercules in the earliest days. But in terms of non-sailing ship business, anything that can float, um, you would have seen Hercules tow at one point or another. Um, barge traffic, a lot of that. Uh, broken down steam and motor ships. Uh, one of her biggest tows was a log raft. It could be between seven and eight million board feet worth of lumber. Yeah. Really, really efficient way to move lumber. It was also a really boring voyage for the crew because it took so long. Those, those log rafts were massive and it was a really slow tow. Um, but yeah, anything that could float. Uh, you might see Hercules moving coastwise or occasionally out across uh, the Pacific. Her first voyage though, uh, she actually towed her sister tugboat named Goliath, and they went uh, from uh, New Jersey, where they were built, and they went around South America to San Francisco. So there was no Panama Canal at the time, so they had to go the long way via the Strait of Magellan around South America, and that was a 72-day voyage. So that was pretty noteworthy. Do a 360, and that should be a good shot. Oh. Especially with uh, the fog. Day, after, we can see how the deck curves really far upwards there. Yeah. That's a clear indication of ocean going. So if you get into a storm uh, and you pound in the waves, hopefully you're right up and over those waves instead of through them. Unless you're a submarine, you don't want to be going under the water. If you can help it. Cool. So if they, a uh, question, if they would tell 
this boat would tow other boats into the harbor would then different kinds of tugboats do the parking, so to speak? Generally speaking, yes. You'd see smaller harbor tugs that were more maneuverable and smaller that could get in between the docks far easier. You'd see them sort of take over and maneuver the ship up to a dock if that's where the ship was going. Some ships were going to an anchorage and they're not actually docking. So Hercules might actually just easily tow a ship to its anchorage spot and the ship lets go its anchor when the time's right. Well, I'm gonna put it to you guys, the viewers once again. Should we go up or down? Up to the pilot house or down to the engine room maybe? Uh, go, go up. up. <laughs> yeah, top to bottom. All right, everybody watch your head. <laughs> I'm short. You want to show them the ladder we're going to climb up there? So that first one was kind of tight, but this one's far steeper. And JR might need to hand you guys to me. You got it? <laughs> he says you guys are heavy. <laughs> All right. Okay, so this particular pilot house was built onto the ship in 1941. It's actually a half deck higher than the original one, and that's because of her changing careers. I've had some good questions about harbor tugs versus ocean tugs so far, um, but to put it bluntly, um, starting in the early 20s, early mid 20s, Hercules did become a harbor tug. She was sold from her owners for ocean going use. She was kind of old at that point. Uh, but she was then purchased by railroad operators and she would tow barges filled with trains back and forth across San Francisco Bay. And those barges would have been right over here, tied up alongside. They called it towing on the hip. And the original pilot house just could not see over those railroad cars. So they built this heightened pilot house. But most of the stuff you'll see inside is original from 19. Oh, that is cool. That's cool. Right here. You're right. There's a river up there. A number of these windows are designed to be lowered down. Right now, they're doing work, carpentry work, so we can't lower them for you. But uh, the captain easily could have leaned out and screamed at people on deck. JR's capturing some of that view for you. Need to wash the windows. Stay <laughs> <laughs> forever up there. Looks like. Be a little scary if you're just looking at a wall of water from there. Yeah. Big waves. So yeah, really good view from up here. Although if you can imagine, just suppose that Hercules and you're the crew member and you're out at sea and you're getting into a storm. This pilot house is really, really tall. So it would be throwing you around as you're rocking like a catapult. That's why the original pilot house was lowered. Elbow grease, um, and there's a lot of machinery on here and sometimes you, you have to use a lot of muscle power with it. But at the same time, you really can't replace any of this. So it's basically taking you know, your best judgment um, and applying the amount of elbow grease that you know, the situation needs while hoping that you're not going to cause any undue wear or tear or damage to the object. Um, so it is a delicate balance. Uh, by far the most challenging thing I would say is finding people with the skill sets, especially with steam machinery is concerned. But there are still some steam ships out in the world, uh, not too many, um, but they're steam turbine ships versus the steam reciprocating engine that this ship has. And that basically means instead of the engine having a fan that the steam turns around, um, uh, Hercules has an engine where it's got pistons that get pushed up and down. So that kind of technology and finding people that know how to maintain that, that's really difficult too. So yeah, it's a delicate balance. Um, 
but we're lucky that some of this is original. Some of it was added later in the ship. So there right now is showing you where the wheel is attached to. And you can see it at the top and at the bottom. This is an original piece. So the pilot house was built in 1941, but they transferred this wheel to the new pilot house. And that's the people that built the ship right there. That's how we know this is original. John Dialog and Son Engineers and Shipbuilders, located in Camden, New Jersey. They're the ones who built this. So we've got the name of the builders right there, nicely well preserved. Yep. And so this is the attachment uh, for the steering wheel that goes down one deck to a steam powered steering engine. So just like most cars today have power steering, Hercules had that too, but it was a steam engine that applied the power. And so that's what uh, the wheel's connected to there. Ooh, going the wrong way. Going the wrong way. Whoop. All right. This device is something that's actually not original, even though it's still pretty old. Uh, this is called the engine order telegraph. And it's pretty well known as far as movies are concerned. I mean, a lot of Hollywood movies love to show this device, uh, but they usually screw up, you know, what they're showing. It gives the impression that this is a throttle and it's purely a telegraph to the engine room. So when I move this handle like I'm doing right now, what that's actually doing is moving the middle arrow on a dial down to the engine room and tells them what direction and what speed he wants them to go. And the crew down there, what they do, they then grab the handle on their dial and move it back and forth and they line it up with this arrow. So that when they do that, I'm actually seeing this arrow go back and forth and they're going to match up with my arrow. So today we would call this a call and response system. We signal the crew down there, they signal us back, and then they carry out that command. Question. Yeah. Uh, does this one work? Is it connected down below? Okay, so uh, does this telegraph work? The, the answer is yes. So, in theory, one of us could go down there later. Mm -hmm. use this. I could even rush down there right now if you want me to. Okay. Unless I, it's more interesting down there to hear it and see it. Yeah, but we could do that towards the end. Maybe come back up here, one person stay down there. And both of you. Video you guys uh, like that? Like the sound of that? When we're down to the engine room, we're actually mm -hmm. operating for you. How does that sound? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's one, yeah. one thing to explain it, but it's uh, much more fun to actually see it in operation. If we put both um, sure. <laughs> Is that we can see both sides happen. Um, when one of us, for example, say I depart the engine room, once I'm out the door, uh, you could probably activate your microphone. Yeah. So yeah, we can we'll make that happen. Yeah. Um, but uh, I did say that this was not original to the ship. And if you look down here, I'm not sure if it's going to come well over the uh, camera, but you can you see the name right there? S. Oh, yeah. And it says Klamath. Yep. And it, there's two S's. So it, that stands for Steam Schooner Klamath. So this actually comes off a different ship. So this was something borrowed and added to Hercules. Again, we think in the 1940s. Because the original system is actually behind its plywood. Okay. So I'll let JR capture this real quickly and then we'll head to another spot. But on the wall, you can see two metal handles with a wire going straight down from each one. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so those two handles each go to a bell in the engine room. And so when you pull, one or both of these handles up, it actually rings those bells, a big bell and a small jingle bell. And so that was a code that you could use to signal the engine room before the telegraph was installed. So whenever you hear some, usually a Navy movie, if, they, if you're watching a movie and you hear someone yell, tell the engine room to stand by to answer bells, that actually comes from this really, really old system. When they, were, when they actually would ring bells and have a, a code, like two bells and a jingle, or two jingles and a bell, that would signal the engine what speed and direction we wanted them to go. It's just it was a bit more difficult to use, and later on you saw the telegraph replace it. But that's why this telegraph is not original, because it came through Hercules much later in time. But this aspect of teamwork is really important. So if you want to see the engine room, to the opposite side of things, we'll go down the room. We want to look at the engine real quick, since we're up here, and then go to the engine room. What do you guys think? You want to see the power steering? Sure. Go for it. Right. Take a quick look at that and then head Good. to the engine. You got a sure and a go for it. All so. right. Now I uh, don't trust myself. 
That's a great view from up there, Karen. <laughs> and the fog's lifted just enough we can see Alcatraz. Yep. Boy, the water is pretty calm. Yeah. Yeah, the wind's not. It's not blowing too bad. Uh, at least right here, we got kind of about two of our other ship next to us up to it down. But yeah, it's actually it's actually pretty calm this morning. It's kind of nice out. Yeah, it's not always calm, but when it is, it's usually in the mornings because the wind usually picks up in the afternoon. Almost exactly horizontal line of fog on this marine layer that's kind of lightening up over Sausalito and Angel Island. It's like this perfect horizontal line. Yeah. I see it lightening. The crazy thing is, if we come over just to the other side and we look over at the Golden Gate, it's just like dark, dark clouds over here. Yeah. Like it's dark until we see mountain mountains yet. It's actually just like the fog is over there. So, and you are looking at the bridge. You can see the bridge, you just can't see the towers. But uh, yeah, so we'll see what happens. The bridge may not come out fully in view today, but I think uh, it's connected to the wheel. And the idea is if you turn the wheel just a little bit, you want the rudder to turn just a little bit. So the engine is very finely tuned. Oh, okay. Well, well that Where's the oil can? Probably <laughs> one in here. One around. One of these dies. I'm getting dirty, actually. Oh, goodness, a brush. So you wow. Could brush. wow. So this is a kind of a cool thing. We got this drag shaft coming down here, and it comes down into the system. So many gears here, but it does kind of amazing thing. So all these chains are going out you know, through a hole here. That's on the one side of the ship. Traces all the way down, all the way up to the rudder. And just to reinforce, uh, this is the captain's cabin that we're standing in right now. Uh, so off to JR's left is the actual captain's bunk. And again, this all dates from around 1941, uh, 1907. That's when they changed the pilot house. But you can still see um, it's a pretty high face here. So if you did have some rolling and you're sleeping at night, you're not going to easily roll out of the bunk. Uh, they got drawers underneath, but one of the more interesting is this thin one for charts. Oh, yeah. Probably San Francisco Bay charts because this was a harbor tug at that point. But if you did go out, you know, they can navigate. It's good. Yep. So that's, that silver thing is a smokestack. The boilers literally blow our feet. And uh, yeah, it's just important to remember that on a steamship, everything, even the main engine, is going to be dead unless the boiler is actually doing its job of making steam. So. The boiler room is kind of the heart of the ship, and the engine room is where that power supplies. Jeffrey's asking whether you ever take this boat out on the water now. Change that. I've got to go down to this left here and into the machine shop and throw a switch, and I'll do that very quick. But just the disease. Um, the uh, question for do we take the ship out? The, the short answer is recently no. They're showing uh, a ship. We have recently. Um, yeah. We do run the engine here at the dock, but right now we don't take it out for a spin. I'm going to open this just to increase signal. It's really something how the woodwork, even inside there, is beautiful. <laughs> yes. Yeah, very wood panel, if you can believe it. Um, having woodwork in and of itself was partly to uh, insulate the space, but for a tugboat, having something like cherry wood, 
That's a great if, if you're trying to sell your product. You know, if you're going to bring on waterfront reporters or, or ship owners who might want to hire your tug for, for services, this is how you make your tug stand out. And this is basically a company office for a tug boat. So yeah, the cherry wood is really quite striking. Uh, the main engine here, which has got this green outer coating. Uh, this is what I was referring to up top. It's got pistons in it. Um, specifically, it's called a triple expansion steam engine. So, from the front where I am towards the back, where JR is right now, you basically would have three main cylinders of the engine, and each cylinder had a piston, but they're all different sizes. So, the one JR's got his hand over, that's the low pressure cylinder, that's the biggest one. But the steam starts at the smallest one. And each time the steam uses some of its energy, it needs a bigger piston to push on to do the same amount of work as it did in the first one. So the bottom line here is that uh, the steam expands three times. It pushes the piston three times. And so it all comes down to turning three cranks. So if you like technology, feel free to ask questions. But if you don't really like machinery, then all you have to remember is this engine turns three cranks. That's really what it comes down to. Again? I wonder how noisy it was in there. You'd be surprised. You could hear me talking at this volume. Um, the noisiest ah. thing here is actually not the main engine. It's the thing in the back corner behind JR's left shoulder. Just behind that, uh, that ladder there, that small engine. They call that a dynamo. We would call it a generator. Basically like electricity for lights. And that thing runs at a really high rate of speed. It makes quite a bit of racket. But the main engine... Despite its size, there's not even a muffler on it because it's it's not really making noise. It's the, the steam inside is expanding, and that's what pushes a piston versus a modern day car engine or a lawnmower where gasoline goes into the cylinder and explodes. That's what they mean by internal combustion. So, in a modern car engine, truck engine, lawnmower, um, they make a lot of noise because there's a series of explosions happening inside the engine. But on a steam engine, that's not happening. So, it's actually fairly quiet. Yeah. So when we have steam up here at the dock, we actually do run that generator too, and it still makes electricity from 1907. Wow. The one thing that we have to be careful of is that, that we have to change all the light bulbs to the older fashioned incandescent bulbs. Oh, yeah. There's a possibility with the new energy efficient bulbs that, that we might blow the light bulbs out because they're just not that compatible. You get a surge. Yeah. JR right now is going to try taking you guys down to the lower level. Uh oh. Slowly he turned inch by inch. This is actually one of my favorite ladders on, on board. Um, the ladder going down to the boiler room is even longer, but this one is just one of the cutest, tiniest, narrowest ladders. But it gets down to one of the most special places, the lower level of the engine room. So what you're looking at right in here, these are the cranks. So specifically right in here is a low pressure crank. And it can be a little hard to clearly see and, and label in your head what is what. But basically what my foot is, this is one of the cranks. So this is what's going around in a circle. Okay. Here, so I think this one has a little better light. Okay. So, these pieces on the side, all of our drive shaft. Coming down. And there's the crank. There's the crank, so this piece is connected on either side of the piece. So if this was a hand-turned crank, you would grab that spot right in the middle of those two big pieces of metal there. Right. So what J.I. was pointing out was the middle, or what they would call the intermediate pressure, piston and crank. And there, from a mechanics point of view, um, one of the fascinating things is that there's no transmission system. You know, there's no gears. 
<laughs> a steam engine that has pistons is most efficient at low speeds. And propellers are exactly the same way. They're most efficient at low speeds. So you've got these cranks directly connected up, straight back, going out to the back of the ship and connecting to the propeller. Steam turbines, which are much more modern, they're the opposite. They have to have a series of transmission gears to make it efficient, but everything here is connected directly up. The one thing you worry about is all that thrust coming the propeller into the ship. You don't want that thrust going into the engine. It could damage all the parts to it. So right here, you get something called a thrust block. And so the propeller shaft has a series of discs that fit into these little spots that you see. And so all that thrust uh, goes into the skeleton of the ship. It does not go into the engine. So this is a pretty important item here. Everything that you see here um, had to be lubricated, had to be cooled down. And you do have some automatic drip devices. In fact, you've got one that's got some good light on it right here. And you see this sort of copper brass colored cup right here. It's got metal shavings in the top of it. Can you guys see that? Yep. Okay. So we got a tube coming down into it and we got two tubes coming out the bottom of it. That's part of the dripping lubrication system that it gets lube oil to all the pieces that are running hot and needs to get lubricated. But the only way to be sure that all that was working was to actually touch the crank. And so if we go back to that middle crank there, JR. But can you see where this piece connects into the crank? Yes. A little groove right there in between the two. That's where you'd have to reach in with your hand and touch while the engine's running. Uh, nice. And at full speed, the engine's going about 90 revolutions per minute. <laughs> oh, so you're not going to reach way over there. You, you're probably going to keep your hand somewhere right in here, closer, right over here. And let the crank combine and swipe the top of your hand. But it's a really delicate process. Uh, you know, crew members have lost fingertips doing this kind of thing. You know, it's it's dangerous just by itself, let alone on a ship that might be going through a storm. Yeah. Um, but you have to constantly check that sort of thing because if you're in a storm and you just can't do it right, the engine could be overheating and you don't know it until something bad happens. So it's a really, really vital job. So it's... I'm not going to go through all the different details I know about this engine, but that's one good little story about how the, the human side and the technological side really are very closely connected. Because most people come on board and they just associate this as a technological story. And that's true to an extent, but from my point of view, you really can't separate the human and the human. So that's, that's one of the things. I'm just going to show, uh, the sort of things that'll show up here. Uh, this is that other there spot we where we would rest. This is the distance so between where your hand has to go. So, I'll cut you yeah. Off there. so yeah, as that's going by, I mean, it is just barely wider. I'm touching on that side. I'm touching on that side. It's just barely wider. <laughs> Luckily, you can't do that through Zoom or else I'd ask for volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you're looking for, I had one guy who did this job. He says, if some oil came off on your hand that's kind of bluish in color, that's okay, but if it was black, it's way too hot. And he did that job during World War II, and that's not what he wants to see, not just because it's bad for the engine, but because there's German U-boats around you trying to sink you. And so if there was black oil coming off, it means not only that the ship's got an engine problem, but that you're going to be in danger as the convoy sails away from you while you try to fix your engine and catch back up to it. And that means you're going to get in luck. So... You know, there's, there's, there's implications, you know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, you're trying to lubricate the engine, but what, what's the human potential cost? What does that mean? So there's, there's a broader story between blue oil and black oil and what, what that means to people. Right. Okay. So we're going to take them to the uh, boiler room. Is that right there? Okay. So this is that ladder that I briefly mentioned back in the engine room. This is the longest ladder on the ship. Whoa. Yeah, looks like it. So, yeah, it's tall looking at it from up here, but let me go down part way. Please. Can, it. Somebody put a net at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He 
You gonna catch him? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> JR, there are some deck plates that are moved a few slightly, so just bear that in mind. Uh, sometimes you hear this room referred to as the fire room, uh, usually the boiler room, but sometimes the fire room because that's what these guys are doing. They're maintaining the fire. So unlike a city, uh, these firemen are not always putting fires out. Sometimes they're lighting. Uh, that's what's going on inside the boiler here. And that's what this is. It's a gigantic. It's mm -hmm. So the idea here is, is that you pipe your power all over the ship. Today, we tend to wire our power all over cities and ships and stuff like that. In fact, when this was built, everything on board except the lights was a human, so you would pipe the power. But to make that happen, you've got to get one of these furnaces going. So when you're getting ready to light a fire in the boiler, you first open what's called a register, so the air can get around and inside the combustion. Just on the outer face, this opening right in here, is where you would insert a very long tube in there called a burner. And as the oil comes up and goes through the burner, it gets to the very end, and you force it through a tiny little hole, and it turns it into a, a spray, a mist. And that's what you want to burn. And the cool thing about lighting one of these on is how you do that. Here is a, a torch. All right, let's see, it's ready to go. This is soaking kerosene. Oh, oh wow. All right. So you would take a lighter or a match or whatever, light this thing on fire. I've done this a few times. Flames get going. You walk over to the furnace. Insert. Inside. Open the valve here. And that fuel goes down. The burner turns into mist and hits that flame. And you'll hear a dull thump. At that point, the fire is going well, and you can pull the torch back out. Yeah, sometimes my oven goes thump. <laughs> uh, usually when you pull the torch back out, the air is being sucked inside so forcefully that it blows the torch out here like a mess. There's going to be a lot of speed changes when you come into a place a city, uh, a dock, or whatever. So it's going to get busy down here because the dimension is going to be really chaotic. So you might have all three firemen down here when you're coming in or out of port. So let's say that you're not coming in port. You're just out there on the ocean, steaming day after day after day. You're down here by yourself. One fireman. And that's a significant storyline that we often talk about here because what makes Hercules stand out from 1907 when she was built is that she used oil. She never used coal. And a lot of people are surprised, especially from 1907. Coal was the fuel bank. But not here on the West Coast. There's very little coal here in California. But there was oil. So they made the switch to oil a lot sooner. The human impact of that choice was that you were only meeting one person down here at a time on a regular day. And normally that's not a big deal. You're keeping your eye on things and making adjustments, you're cleaning burners and everything's normal, everything's fine. But if you are down here during a storm, it could be a pretty intimidating thing. So let's just for, for argue that say that there's a new guy on board, he's fully qualified, but he's going through his first storm at night. Right? There might be more light coming from the flickering flames than from the light bulb from 1910, right? an early incandescent light bulb from 1910. Sort of a flickering glow down here, and the ship is just going up. And we have some accounts from this very ship that talk about, uh, but the captain talked about one time how Hercules snorted up on air. He was talking about going up there. And so if you were down here trying to do the job here with the boiler, imagine the boiler, you go up away, the boiler goes up there. So you're looking up at the boiler. And then you get to the top of that wave, and there's that really enjoyable moment of zero gravity. Right? If you go over the wave and drop in. So you have been looking up at the boiler, but then the ship goes over the wave, and the boiler goes underneath you. 
They're wow. going to take this ladder to do life. If they want yeah, to from to falling them. into it. Jeez. Um, so it really depends on what's going on in terms of how many people are going to be down here and what their experience is like. Well, that depends on, you know, have they been doing the job for years or are they new? Is it a calm day or is it a storm? Here's the fuel pumps. They're hard to kind of see. They're a tangle of piping. There's two of them. One right here and the other right back there. Let's you know the pressure inside the boiler. And the boiler was designed to operate at 180 pounds per square inch. Really sorry, guys. If you're up north, I don't know how that translates into the back. Off to the left here are the heaters. These will be used to heat the fuel up. Uh, oil can get very viscous, so you would heat it up to get it to the point where it's easy to spray. And the last thing I can really take the point out, I'll have JR look up so you can see where that light bulb is. Right in front of that light bulb, hopefully you guys can see a glass tube. JR yeah, will point it out. Oh. It's called a water gauge glass. It shows you the water level in the boiler. You're aiming for that Goldilocks zone, right? Not too high, not too low. You're just right. Hopefully, all the pipes that connect to that glass tube are not getting filled with sediment and giving you a false reading. That's one of the things this guy had to constantly check and make sure to clear out any sediment so that he's not looking at false information. I'll send JR back to the engine room. I'm going to head up to the pilot house and we'll end by bringing that uh, engine order telegram. Chris is probably up there. Chris, I'm down here. Okay. You good to go? Yeah, yeah. So Chris is on that handle that we saw earlier. Okay, so I'm going to play the part of the captain. JR is the engine room chief. I'm going to signal him. Here we go. Oh, we see it. Yeah. My job is to confirm that I saw and that I heard. Okay, did you guys hear that small bell? Yeah, yep. great. That was the bell where I am. So it gets my attention just like it gets the attention of the engineer. No, so oh. I move his, I move mine, and when they're matching, both the captain and the engineer know that they're doing the same thing. They're mismatching. Oh. Definitely gets your attention. Let's see if I can do this. See if I can do this while I'm filming here. It's actually really hard to do. I got to use like a lot of muscle to get that. So I, I had, <laughs> so I couldn't do it from far away. I didn't have the leverage. <laughs> right, yeah, it made it stiffer recently for some reason. It's kind of an iconic sound, isn't it? Yes, it really? is. Certainly is. I think I accidentally cut you off last time. I want to make sure. Thank you, guys. This has been Thank lovely. You. Yep. Don't have to bad. Well, I guess we're finished. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Finished you guys enjoy. <laughs> That's the coolest ending we've ever had, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye, guys. Take care. Uh, bye bye. We'll see you soon. I'll at least, uh, I'll at least wave bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. You guys, you guys well. We'll see you soon. Yeah.